P-O-L-L-E-S. Stephen, are you here? Stephen says, man, how did you get that? <laughs> Whose do you have? <laughs> Thank you. Well, what a blessing the day has been the night before, and what we have to look forward to is even expected is to be greater, and we are hoping that. So for the next while, a dear friend of mine will be speaking to you, with you, sharing with you in a very unusual accent. He's from South Georgia. That's that South Georgia lingo that he speaks by. David is from uh, England originally. He's now from Macon, Georgia. That seems to be the mecca of the Southeast right now. I think there's some 50,000 refugees in Macon, Georgia running from a hurricane. Maybe they've started to split out of there now and go back. They all seem to just end right there, I guess, camping out. Oh, wow, 75 and 16 come together there, and that makes a wonderful haven to hide out, huh? The center, is that, is that, the, is that the center of the world? It is to some, huh? It is to those running from hurricanes. As I had mentioned earlier, Dave has, play, has uh, plowed some fields that, that many of us never had to go out and work in. And uh, many of you have never had to get out and plow the fields that he's plowed. Revival has come easy to some of us, but Dave was out... Uh, speaking about revival in children and teens before most of us were even awake to the fact. <clears throat> when I was at that conference in, uh, in Orlando, I did make that statement as I was sitting there watching Dave minister and his children minister, and I said, that's great, but it'll never happen in my children's ministry and wouldn't have. It would not have happened in my children's ministry in Montgomery, Alabama. It never, never could have. Um, I don't believe it ever would have, but when God brought us here, he let us see the the results of what Dave's teaching was here. I'll talk a little bit about that tonight and how the Lord led me uh, to a, a new level of ministry, which was very much patterned after exactly what Dave had talked about in those earlier days, and, and I never thought would ever happen. But uh, I want him to come up and share his heart with you for the next hour or so and, um, and bless you. And that's what he is. is he's, he's a blessing to us. And we'll bless you wonderfully, I'm sure. So with that, Dave, would you come on? <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you very much. How many of you feel like taking a nap? Uh, honest people. Well, remember, this is not nap time. There's only one thing worse than a pre than uh, when people falling asleep when a preacher is preaching, and that is if the preacher himself falls asleep in the middle of his message. When that happens, things are really getting bad. But... um. Whenever I preach to kids, I always lay down the rules first. And one of the biggest rules is no napping. No one's allowed to nap. No one's allowed to play with toys. No one's allowed to color. No one's allowed to cry or, or uh, whine or gripe. That's all against the rules. No kids are allowed to roll on the floor. And no one's allowed to go to the bathroom unless it's an emergency. And uh, I tell them, we know when it's an emergency because if it is, your face will turn green. And I tell the kids, if I see anybody breaking the rules, I will call for a 10-ton angel to drop down from heaven and squish you. And it really works. They really pay attention. And in fact, they even uh, poke their parents to keep them awake sometimes, make sure they pay attention. But um, just for those of you that, uh, you know, I do live in Macon, Georgia, originally from England. I do travel all over the country speaking at churches. I don't, do not do... I do go to small churches if they're not, you know, too tiny. I don't speak at, um, I don't go to house group churches or um, cell groups or home group meetings, but I do go to churches of all kinds of sizes and so on. So if you're interested um, in me possibly coming to your area sometime and doing something, I do crusades and things with other churches and so on, um, then please just... Uh, let our people at our book table know, and they will uh, make sure you get an information package or call our office and uh, give them your name and address, and we'll send you something. Praise God. Hallelujah. Equipping the younger saints. This is what this session is about, equipping the younger saints. And uh, if you'll turn with me to Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4.11. If 
for he himself, let me just get my glasses out so I can read. For he himself, that's of course talking about Jesus, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints. And I've got in parentheses here, including children and teens, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying or the building up of the body of Christ. Of course, I think most of us have known for many years that there has been a restoration of the fivefold ministry gifts of apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. Uh, for many, many years, we kind of uh, limped along on a couple of the ministries, maybe two or three. There's been a restoration of the apostolic and the prophetic ministry uh, very much in the last few years. Um, it was known uh, a number of years ago as the hand ministry. Fivefold ministry is the hand ministry. The thumb, which represents the apostle, he's the one that wraps himself around all the other digits. The finger that points is the prophet because he points out the problems uh, and he points the direction in which the church should be going. The finger that is the longest, he reaches out to the lost, he's the evangelist. The finger that has the ring, that's the shepherd, the shepherding, has the heart of the Lord, that's the pastoral ministry. And then the little finger uh, that, you know, you can use to sort of scratch your ear, He's the one that gets into the nooks and the crannies. He's the kind of detail one. He's the teacher. And so there it is, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher, the fivefold ministry gifts. Now, these ministry gifts, of course, that we have enjoyed and experienced over the years are not just for us to gawk at. I think one of the biggest mistakes that's been made in the church is that we have created the fivefold ministry gifts to become like superstars that you come to watch them do the work. You come to watch how anointed they are and how awesome they are and uh, they love to have an audience where you can contribute to their ministry so they can become bigger and more super and more great. But that's never been the real heart of God because the fivefold ministry gifts are not for you to come and gawk at. Oh, we had an apostle come to our church. We had a prophet come into town. It was totally awesome. They are there to equip the saints so that the saints can begin to do the work of the ministry. For too long, because parents and church members have sat in pews and watch the ministry done by the professionals from the platform because the people, they've never really done very much apart from just coming, listening to the messages and putting their money in the offering and then going home and trying to stay out of trouble. Obviously, our children have never been able to get anywhere. The second thing is that our children should also be exposed to the fivefold ministry gifts and not just to volunteers, helpers, anybody will do. We have any volunteers for the children's church. You know, we need someone to help out in the children's church. Anyone can teach in the children's church. You know, we don't get pastors that, that stand up on Sunday morning and say, we have anybody to volunteer to preach the message this morning? Anybody, you know, you, you know, they won't do that. We're looking for the best, the most anointed, the most uh, gifted ministries. And yet, in the past, churches have more or less grabbed anybody, and it's usually been women. And I've got nothing against women. You know, I believe that God uses women, but, you know, Jesus didn't say to Peter, by the way, Peter, before I begin to preach the message this morning, get some of the women to take the children out to children's church. We know that children were in the meetings that Jesus preached because when he preached to the 5,000, you know, um, after he fed the 5,000, he found a little boy that had 
five loaves and two fishes. So we know that little boy was there. And the 5,000, it said, not, did not include the women and the children. So we know that children came to his meetings. And in actual fact, when they brought the little children to Jesus, you've got the picture there. You know, we, we sometimes get a, a picture of the ministry to children is one of loving kids. Well, it's easy to love kids, you know, because they're usually quite lovable. But those little children that came to Jesus, you know, in, they didn't come and just sit on his lap and pull his beard, and he just gave them a little hug, as it were, and pinched their cheek and said, cute, cute, cute. You know, that wasn't the reason why the, the parents were bringing the infants, actually, was infants to Jesus. They brought the infants to Jesus, not that he would love on them, but he would touch them or bless them or anoint them. And that was the problem with the disciples. Because many pastors would say, oh yes, yes, you know, Jesus brought the little children to Jesus and they were hugging on him and they were pulling his beard and he was loving on them. And the, parent, and the disciples said, oh no, 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 Jesus is too busy. To, oh no, we've always got time to love on the kids. We've always got time to give them a little hug, yeah, bless them, Lord. That wasn't the reason, see, they brought them to Jesus that he might anoint them. And the people, the disciples said, no, anointing is not for children. Jesus said, it is. Let me impart something to them. Let me bless them. Let me lay my hands on them. So we know that children need to be exposed to the fivefold ministry gifts. So we need apostles for the children. The apostolic ministry is a foundation ministry. The church is built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus in Christ, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. God has set in the body first apostles, then prophets. Now, in most cases, when apostles and prophets come into an area, the children are sent out. It's like Mark was saying earlier this afternoon. He said he went to this meeting and he said, you know, they were having a healing meeting and he said the first ten rows, he said, I don't want any kids sitting in the first ten rows. And I, I've been in the same thing. I remember we had a conference in Charisma and we had a, a, a big name there, a big healing evangelist who came and the first thing he said, and it was a children's conference, he said, I don't want any children in the front rows. Send them out. And they were freaking out. You know, all the children's pastors were freaking out. But I understand it's like, well, kids are disruptive. They, are, they can't concentrate. They're going to get in the way. They're going to spoil the anointing. So stick them at the back and send them out. And I'm saying, no, bring them in. Bring them in and train them. See, many, many parents want the children to offer a babysitting service free and they regard you guys as the babysitters and they get free babysitting so they can enjoy the service without being bothered without having to discipline or train their children and uh, you're back there in the back room with the children and you're working with them, you're trying to put some input into them, trying to, you know, introduce them to the Lord and do spiritual things with them. And then, you know, they, they come, and when they're ready, they come, come on now, we're going now. I remember a couple of years ago, I was at a church in, actually it was Free Chapel in Gainesville, Georgia, and um, Rod Parsley was speaking there, and, and T.D. Jakes was speaking, they had these big meetings, and they asked me to do a couple of nights as a guest with the children. So, um, I'm doing the second night with the children. And uh, I was just ministering to them, and the Spirit of God was just coming on the kids. And um, suddenly some of the parents came in, and they saw their kids. They said, come on, come on. I said, stop! Don't you dare do that. I said, you wait, please. I said, this is a very sensitive part of the meeting. I said, we are not babysitting your children. Please wait. So they drew back and they waited. 
And the anointing began to come on those children. And the children began to fall on their knees and the tears began to run down their face and the presence of God was all over them. And you could see that the, the glory of God was all over these children. And then the parents, when they, they began to see it, they, they went, and then they began to cry. They never knew that could happen to their children. They never knew that that was possible. And the problem, you see, we have, folks, is that when, when that happens and those children are set off like that, when the children, when the parents bring the children out, you know, afterwards, and the kids say, I mean, how did the kids explain to their parents what happened? And if the parent, if the kids say something, oh, it was awesome, they say, oh, come on, that's cute. Come on, get in the car. Let's go, let's go. That's sweet. That's nice. That's cute. And so we know that there's been a missing gap so I'm saying that we need apostles to the children and apostles to those that work with children. You guys need more than curriculum. You need more than going to a conference to find the latest gimmicks. And again, I'm not, I'm not saying there's anything wrong like Mark with any of the props. I mean, they're good. But you can't just give kids props all the time. You know that. That's like spiritual candy and spiritual dessert. Everybody likes dessert and candy, but you can't live on candy and dessert all the time. So we need that apostolic foundation. And I don't know personally of any apostles as yet that are coming into a whole church and are changing the philosophy of children's ministry to bring it from a traditional church foundation to a biblical apostolic foundation. Because usually most apostles and prophets are too busy ministering to the adults, and they don't have too much time for the children. So we need to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. We need apostles and we need prophets. See, so you need to have an apostolic and prophetic impartation so that you can bring these children into the anointing. You can bring these children into their giftings. I remember I was ministering. If my memory serves me right, it was a number of years ago. I think I was at... Um, Bradenton, doing a conference there. And I started to move in the prophetic. I don't call myself a prophet, but sometimes if the prophetic anointing comes upon me on the mantle, I'll start to move in the prophetic. You know, when we have our miracle service, sometimes, you know, we move in the supernatural and healing. Sometimes it's in prophetic. Sometimes it's in the word of knowledge and so on. And I began to move in the prophetic. And I always remember there was a boy, a young boy there. He was sitting there and he'd been in the meetings. He was about 10 or 11. And suddenly he got up and he followed me, and like he came under that umbrella that I was um, moving in. He came under that same umbrella of anointing, and he began to, began to go up, and he began to prophesy and pray for people, not just other kids, but the adults too. I mean, he was prophesying to me, he was praying for them, and he did this for about 25, 30 minutes. We were just moving around, and suddenly when he stopped, it was like the anointing came off of him, he went, Oh, oh my goodness. He says, I've never done that before. He said, I, I've never prayed out loud to people before. I've never prophesied. He said, and especially grown-ups have never done that before. He said, how come I did that? I said, you didn't. He said, I didn't. I said, uh-uh. He said, well, if I didn't do it, who did it? I said, it was the Holy Ghost. He said, it was. I said, yeah. He said, wow. See, the Holy Ghost came upon him, and he was carried along by the Spirit of God. So out of that young, immature, 11-year-old boy was coming the wisdom of God. See, Jesus was a young boy when he was 12 years of age. It said the child grew became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. 
Well, how would you like every one of your children to be like that? We know that children grow, that's obvious, the child grew. Became strong in not biblical knowledge, not strong in Christian education, not strong in the mind or in the soul realm, but strong in spirit filled with wisdom. Now, children are not filled with wisdom. Children are foolish. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. Children are not known for their wisdom. They are born foolish. That's why they go to school, so they won't end up, end up being dummies. I mean, you don't rush up to a little child, you know, and kneel before them. I don't know if there's any small children here. Say, oh, fount of all wisdom, speak to me. Children are not known for their wisdom. But God takes the foolish things. Huh? Said before, to confound the wise, yeah. And God are not, children are not known for their, str their strength. They're not big, strong. They're weak compared with adults. God takes the foolish things and the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. But because he takes the, the weak things and the foolish things, he says, let the weak say I'm strong. And he makes the weak strong and he makes the foolish wise through his anointing. Awesome. So, bringing children into that anointing is where it's at. In the book, Children of Flame, John Wesley says that little children spoke with the wisdom of the aged in those days of revival. Powerful. See, a lot of people see children just in the natural. That's why they don't think they're ready to be equipped. They see them just as little kids, and, and they say, well, you know, one day, you know, just love Jesus now. But when you're older and when you're bigger, maybe God can use you, but not now because you're just a little kid. God says, no, there's no age in the Spirit. God used a donkey once. Another time he spoke out of a bush. Used a stick to part the Red Sea. So if God can use sticks, donkeys, and bushes, he can certainly use a child. Hey, he can use you, young man. He can use a donkey. There's hope for you. All you've got to say is, ee oh, ee oh, ee oh. God can use you. <laughs> right. So part of equipping the children is to give them a vision and a revelation of what God wants to do with them. God doesn't look at children and say, oh, I can't use kids. Hey, I can use anybody but kids. Actually, they qualify more than any of us. The weaker you are, the punier you are, the littler you are, the greater you qualify. God can do a little with a lot. He can do a lot with a little, but he can do everything with nothing. It says in the book of Job, he hangs the world upon nothing. In fact, Jesus was the epitome of weakness in his ministry. Everything that Jesus did, he never did. Everything that Jesus said, he never said. And everything that Jesus was, he never was. Do you get that? Everything that Jesus did, he never did. He said, the works that I do are not my works, but the works of him that sent me. He said, the words that I speak are not my words, but the words of him. And he said, he that has seen me has not seen me, but has seen the Father. And the greatest victory that Jesus did was in his death. And his ultimate weakness was his greatest strength. I mean, how many of you have ever been sick? So sick you felt as though you couldn't even get out of bed. Anybody ever felt like that? Yeah. I mean, you just couldn't get out. You felt, Ugh. Well, the ultimate weakness is deaf. I mean, deaf people, dead people, are so weak they can't even blink 
their eyelids. Ah. Uh. Oh, have you ever had that problem? I mean, you, listen, you people that have been so weak, I defy you to tell me there's anyone here in this service tonight, this afternoon, that has been so weak you couldn't blink your eyes. Oh, I can't blink my eye. Oh, it's so, oh, I can't do it. I haven't got the strength to blink my eye. Oh, don't think anyone's been quite there yet. But Jesus, in his weakness, he defeated the devil. In his death was his strength because the tomb became the womb in which the church was birthed. Out of death came resurrection. So God's not, doesn't have a problem with children. Actually, the only limitation they have is what we adults put on them. Mm. So we need to build a biblical foundation for our children's ministry and not a traditional foundation. So we need that apostolic and that prophetic anointing. Evangelists, for example, are supposed to be one of the fivefold ministry gifts to equip the saints so they can become soul winners. And uh, I don't know how much training there is in children to become soul winners, but if you can train your kids to win souls, you're going to have a revival breakout in your church. See, so long the, the evangelist was the guy that went around the country holding crusades, and then churches would say, well, we better do a bit of evangelism. We're bringing B Brother Big Mouth, and he can come and have some crusades. And then he gets a few people saved, and we say, praise God, we had a revival. We got some people saved. We'll have him come back next year and have another revival. That's not what an evangelist is supposed to do. He's supposed to be one of the gifts in the body of Christ that equips the saints, so we all become soul winners, including the children. So children are to win their friends to the Lord. But if they don't know how to, to preach the gospel, if they don't know how to explain the gospel, if they don't know how to explain the mechanics of the gospel, if they've not been equipped and trained in that way, then how can they win someone to the Lord? I don't know what to say. But if we don't know how to evangelize, how are our children going to know how to evangelize? If we never speak to people, how are they going to speak to people? See, you've got to remember this, folks, that if our children are not anointed in church, they're not going to be anointed in the marketplace. If they have a hard time praising God in the church, they're not going to make a stand at school. If the footmen weary you, how will you contend with the horses? So obviously, one of the signs that our children are going to be radical for God is when they're fired up in church, and they're radical for God in the church, which is the, the best atmosphere, the most, the atmosphere that is, is on their side, as it were, the positive atmosphere. If children have not been trained to respond to the presence of God and love the anointing of God and can respond to the worship of God in an atmosphere which is made available for them to respond, they are not going to manage in a negative atmosphere. So obviously we've got to bring that presence of the Holy Spirit, that atmosphere that will hunger them, that they'll come to jump into the river and the things of God. Apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastors. I don't know how many of us that work with children have a pastoral ministry, but that's very important. It's not just teaching children a little curriculum or a little Bible story or a little lesson. Because today, folks, we're having children that are coming from horrendous situations. We've got single-parent homes, dysfunctional homes, abused homes. Children that are coming from backgrounds where they need pastoral ministry. I was with one brother one time and he had a big church with 
2,700 children's children in his church and 350 children's pastors. He brought this little boy to me who was five years of age. He said he tried to kill his mother the other week. He said he'd been so badly abused, he tried to kill his mother. He said, I can't sit him down and tell him little stories about Daniel and the lion's den. He said, this child needs deliverance. This child needs pastoral ministry. I was in ministering in Macon, Georgia, in a black church there a few years ago. And they brought this little girl to me. She was three years of age, as cute as a button. And I picked her up in my arms, and they said she tried to hang herself. I said, what are you talking about? As she tried to hang herself, both her parents were on crack cocaine. She tried to hang herself. I was speaking at a children's camp last year in Midwest, and this little boy, seven-year-old Preston, they said to me, kids came up and said, Mr. Walters, Preston is cutting up. He's swearing at all the other kids and just being nasty to them. So um, I went up to Preston and began to talk to him a little bit. And I said, where's your mother, Preston? He said, she was murdered. I said, where's your dad? He said, he's in jail. Lived with his grandmother. No wonder that kid had problems. By the grace of God, he, he was set free and delivered. And his whole countenance changed during that week at camp. But we really do need people with a pastor's heart for the children. And you know, senior pastors can't just go by and see a little kid and pat him on the head, bless you, and run off. Children are people. They're people. I mean, they're not just kids. They are people. They're not just kids, but they're your brothers and sisters in the Lord. They might be little brothers and sisters, but they're still your brothers and sisters in the Lord. And we have a responsibility. Actually, every individual in the church has a responsibility to minister in some way to the little saints. I don't want to work with kids. not my ministry to work with kids. One of the biggest problems I'm seeing, people say to me who are in the ministry, my son-in-law is a children's pastor. He said, it's so hard to get people that want to work with the children. They don't want to. That's because they don't understand. They don't have a vision. They don't realize that children are people. They don't realize that the children are their brothers and sisters. And they have a responsibility. So I want to try and help you folks this afternoon to take some of the, of the strain off of your backs and the efforts that you're making so that you, in fact, can begin to impart the vision as you go back to your churches and say, listen, children are not just kids. They're God's kids. They're brothers and sisters in the Lord. And they need pastoral care. And children need teaching, obviously. But you know the teaching that we must teach children when we're equipping these saints has to be different from what has been in the past. Because in the past, we have majored on behavior. Straighten up, serve the Lord, be good, don't be mean to your brothers, don't be mean to your sisters, and so on. Now, I want to put it to you folks this afternoon that if we teach children from the serving God, the behavior, instead of actually blessing the children, we are putting them under a curse. Because it doesn't start with serving God, it starts with knowing God. I was raised a, a Roman Catholic, and uh, we had our catechism when I was a kid, and I remember the two, first two catechism questions I was taught, who made you? That was the first question. The answer was, God made me. The second question was, why did God make you? The answer was, God made me to know him, love him, and serve him in this world, and to be happy with him forever in the next. Note the order. Know first, love second, serve third. 
We used to sing a song. The greatest thing in all my life is knowing you. The greatest thing in all my life is knowing you. I want to know you, Lord. I want to know you, Lord. The greatest thing in all my life is knowing you. The greatest thing in all my life is loving you. And then the greatest thing in all my life is serving you. So you start with bringing our children to a knowledge of God. Not a knowledge about God, not knowing about God, but knowing God. And I tell children, listen, if you know God, you'll love Him because He's altogether lovely. And if you love Him, you will want to serve Him. But if you try to teach children to serve God when they don't love Him and they don't know Him and you're just giving them rules and regulations, then you put them under a curse. And the reason I say that is because we find it in Galatians 3. If you'd like to turn with me for a moment. Beginning at verse 10 in Galatians 3. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is every one who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. That no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident. For the just shall live by faith. Yet the law is not of faith, but the one that does them shall live by them. In other words... What Paul is saying in Galatians is that the law will not bring our children salvation, will not bring a person into salvation. And if you give them moral object lessons, rules and regulations, which is okay, but apart from the Spirit, apart from the life of God, it's the letter that kills, the Spirit gives life, you are putting them under a curse. Because they cannot fulfill those rules and regulations in their own strength. So we have to bring them to a place where they have the experience of the Spirit. But Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it's written... Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. So here we have a picture that salvation... See, it's, we know this in a sense, and yet sometimes we miss it. We know that salvation is by grace and grace alone, that you can't save yourself, and yet too many kids are still trying to be Christians. You check it out. Too many of your kids are trying to be a Christian. You ask them next Sunday when you go to church, say, hands up, who's trying to be a Christian? You'll get all the hands go up. Trying has never worked, it never will. Trying is always very trying. People that try to lose weight never do. People that try to give up smoking never do. People that try to come to a meeting never show up. Trying has never worked. You have to make a total commitment. I will, not I will try, I will. And trying to be a Christian doesn't work. In fact, I say to the children, when they put their hands up and say, I'm trying to be a Christian, I say, how many of you girls here are trying to be girls? How many of you boys here are trying to be boys? And if some kid who's not kind of thinking straight puts their hand up, I say, aren't you a boy yet? Haven't you become a boy yet? And they put their hand down. I say, if you don't have to try to be a boy, I say, if you're born a boy, you don't have to try to be one. If you're born a girl, you don't have to try to be one. So why are you trying to be a Christian? You either is or you ain't. If you have received Christ and you've had an experience with God and you've been adopted into his family, then you don't have to try to be one. But you know why kids make that mistake? Because the adults do they fall into the same trap as we do. For example, let me trick you here. 
How many of you here keep the, keep the commandments? How many of you try to keep the commandments? Come on now, be honest with me. No one wants to put their hand up now. Yeah, I can see some of the hands going up. You try to keep it. But you see, I don't know anywhere in the Bible where it says, I, thou shalt try not to commit adultery. Thou shalt try not to steal. Thou shalt try to love the Lord thy God with all. See, trying has never worked. So why were the commandments given? To show us our sinfulness, our impotency, our weakness, that we might what? Try to do better? No, that we might fly to Christ, who is the end of the law to them that believe. See, one of the things that you've got to do, folks, if you are equipping these younger saints, you've got to train them in good theology. You say, but kids don't understand. Ah, you'd be amazed what they can understand, what they can grasp. But, I mean, you can't teach kids that kind of stuff. Try it. Try it. Well, I don't know. I mean, I think, you know, who told you to play the role of the Holy Spirit? Who told you that you are the one to decide what children cannot believe and what they can, what they can understand or what they cannot understand? That's not your job. That's the job of the Spirit of God. Your job is to declare the whole counsel of God. Come on. You're not a babysitter. You're not just feeding these little kids just little bits and pieces. You are to preach to them and teach them the whole counsel of God that they might become powerful and anointed and they have a grasp on what salvation really is. I preach a lot of deep stuff to kids and they seem to sit there with their mouths open drinking it in. I've had kids come to me and say, Mr. Walters, you changed my whole prayer life. You revolutionized my life. I mean, when a five-year-old or six-year-old, seven-year-old says that, you say, well, something must be going on. It goes beyond entertainment, doesn't it? All right, let me just go on here quickly. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. What is the result of that? That the blessings of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that's us, that we might receive what? The promise of the Spirit through faith. Acts 2.38. Repent and be baptized, and you shall receive the gift of of the Holy Spirit, for this promise is unto you and to your children. Hallelujah. Acts 2, 17, in the last day says, God, I will pour out of my Spirit, like John said last night, upon all flesh, not adult flesh only, but kid flesh too. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb. Put that in your theological pipe and try to smoke it. Spirit-filled baby? Uh-huh. What if John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb? What about our little kids. What about our preschoolers? What about our toddlers? You say, oh, hang on, hang on, hang on. They're not John the Baptist. I mean, John the Baptist was a, was a special prophet of God. I mean, our kids are just ordinary kids. But Jesus said in Luke 7, 28, For I say to you among those born of women, there's not a greater prophet than John the Baptist, but he who is the least in the kingdom of God is greater than John the Baptist. And who do we consider to be the least? The children. God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and God has chosen the base things and the things which are despised, God has chosen, and the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. If anybody qualifies, it's the kids. They're despised. They're, they're despised spiritually. They're not despised in the sense that we don't love them, we think they're cute, but they, spiritually speaking, we don't really want to listen to what they have to say. 
Not long now. You don't have anything that you can, you know. Even when kids want to pray for you, you know, it, it, you have to be real careful. Kids say, can I pray for you? Sure, honey. And then we condescendingly, you know, smile and say, oh, cute, cute. You won't receive anything from God when you do that. When a little child lays their sticky fingers on you, you've got to believe that it's the Lord himself flowing through that little vessel. Otherwise, you won't get a miracle. Don't condescend them. Hallelujah. Where was I when I got carried away? Oh, yeah, we're still talking about the teacher. That's right. Now, children, the same as us, they are a tripartite being. In other words, they are three parts, their body, mind, and spirit. So we as parents and we as teachers are to minister to the whole person. We know how their bodies are taken care of. We feed them and, you know, make sure they grow and, you know, feed them and, and take care of them. We give them sleep. They have food, sleep, and exercise. So those areas are taken care of. And uh, we take care of their minds. We send them to school so they can learn or to put them in home school and they learn about the, you know, the things they need to. They learn their maths and science and history, geography, so they won't end up being dummies. So their minds grow. They learn things. And we give them Christian education. And they learn about Daniel and the lion's den and David and Goliath and all the stories of the Bible. And we give them good Christian education. And the danger is if we only minister on those two parts of the child, the body and the mind or the body and the soul, we end up bringing children into a place where they develop into church-wise kids. They learn how to give the answers to the questions just to keep you off their back. Little Johnny, you know, do you love Jesus? Oh, uh -huh. have you got Jesus in your heart? Oh, uh because -huh. he knows that's the right thing to say because that's what you want to hear. Even if little Johnny doesn't love Jesus, he's not going to let on. Do you love Jesus, Johnny? No, I don't. I love the devil. That happens, they're all going to jump on him and try and cast the demons out of him. So he knows that. Now, just in case, when we're talking about the babies, just in case you're thinking, well, you know, Miss, this brother Walter said that children, babies can be filled with the Holy Ghost. Don't you have to be born again first? Don't you have to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior before you can be filled with the Holy Ghost? Yes. Well, you can't go up to a baby with a big black Bible and say, Now listen, baby, are you ready to repent of your sins and accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Because if you don't, you're going to hell. Do you understand that, baby? What's the baby going to do? Yeah! <laughs> you know. Obviously, you can't get babies saved in their minds, but you can minister to their spirits yes my father was Jewish and he got saved in his sleep that's right sounds weird but he did see he'd been to several crusades and that and, and we'd heard about the Lord but in the middle of the night he raised his hand and he cried out Jesus my Messiah and two weeks later he went forward and got saved see his spirit was saved before his mind what, what, did the, what, did, what did the Lord say to Jeremiah the prophet? He said, Jeremiah, before you were born, I knew you. And before you were inside your mother's womb, I ordained you to be a prophet to the nations. That's destiny. That's purpose. See, that happened before he was born. What a wonderful verse against abortion. Come on. That's what God says to our children. Listen, God says, hey, you kids, before you were born, I knew you. Before you were inside your mother's womb, I had a plan and a purpose and a destiny for your life. It 
See, you can't tell children just to behave and be good because that's not a good motivation. Kids know it's more fun to be naughty than to be good. Really. But you can tell children that they have a purpose and a destiny upon their lives. To get back to those little infants, you see, where, this is where you, you, how do you equip infants? Where you see, you minister to their spirits. If a baby is born in a hostile environment where there is strife and anger and violence, the baby doesn't understand what's going on with its mind, but its spirit is damaged. Because those negative forces that are going into its spirit are causing a lot of problems so that when that child grows up, it's going to have so many hang-ups, it'll be very difficult for that child to come to the Lord. But if a baby is born in a Christian environment where there is joy and peace and love and the presence of the Holy Ghost and there is harmony, that baby's spirit will just soak up all those positive elements so that when that baby is ready to understand about the things of God, it'll come right into the things of God because its spirit had been pre already prepared. Prepared. I mean, salvation with God is different than when we think. You could give me, for example, a date in which you came to the Lord. You know, when did you come to the Lord? 1972, 1961, 1995. I mean, everybody's got a different date. But God says, before you were born, I knew you. God said we were conformed to be dead. We were predestined to be conformed to the image of God before the foundation of the world. God doesn't dwell in time. He dwells in eternity. Time is no problem with God. He's talking about the spirit man. So we have children, you see, where we've ministered to their minds and we've ministered to their bodies, but we have not ministered to their spirits. So they end up with peanut or pick me sized spirits. Now God is showing us in these days that we've got to go beyond just the Christian education. We've got to go beyond the curriculum. We've got to go beyond just making them healthy with sports and, and, and exercise and so on. We've got to start to minister to their spirits because you can know all about God through the mind, but you can only know God through the Spirit, see? You can't know God through the mind. You can know about him, but you can't know him. And it's not knowing about God, it's knowing him. They that know God shall be strong and do mighty works, not those that know about God. So God is bringing Christian education to a level that he's never done before. We are coming into a place now where we're going to raise a generation that know God. Not just know the answers to the questions. Not just know the Bible answers. Not just to know. See, we don't want the kids to give us the right answers. We want to give them the truthful answers. When the apostle Paul spoke to the Ephesians in Ephesians 1, he said, my prayer for you is that you might receive what? Good curriculum, good education, good no. He said, my prayer for you is that you might receive what? The spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Here we go. That word knowledge of him. That word no, knowledge, no, is the same word that is used when it says Adam knew his wife Eve and she conceived. It's an intimate knowledge of knowing. If you don't know God, you'll not produce fruit. When a husband knows his wife, he doesn't say, Hello, honey, I know you. I know what you. That word know means that they are intimate. That means that they, they, are having, they are making babies. They are producing fruit. They are, they are coming together. That's the knowledge. That's the knowing. That's the intimacy. And that's the same with when we know Jesus and we have that intimate relationship with God, we uh, become fruit producers or fruit bearers. And we want our children to produce fruit knowing God. My prayer for you is that you might receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope. See, all this can be taught to children. I do it. You say, well, do they understand it? Yes. I mean, it's not my job to know whether that. I just preach it. I just, and the only thing I say, they sit there in silence and they don't fidget and they're there and they're like, 
What? And they don't take their eyes off. And because even if they don't understand every word, they understand something about the anointing. See, and that's the same with the babies. When you, when you minister to those babies, make sure you are anointed. We don't want volunteers for the nursery. Come on. Oh, we'll have a few non-Christians. Well, you don't need non-Christians working in the nursery. Don't have teenage girls working in the nursery if the only reason they want to be there is because they want to miss the service. Don't have women working in the nursery who are going to complain about the pastor and what's wrong with the church and what's wrong with the elders. You say, well, those babies don't understand what's being said. Yeah, but all those negative words are going into their spirits, you see. That's why you have problems in the nursery with crying babies and screaming kids. Listen, when you work in the nursery, you're not there just to change diapers and feeding bottles. You are there because God's called you to be a custodian of destiny. When you're working in the nursery and the pastor comes and you're doing such a good job, we want to promote you. We want you to be an elder to say, thank you very much, pastor, but I have a higher calling. <laughs> I'm called to be a custodian of destiny. How do you minister to those babies? Oh, you read the word of God over them. You sing the songs of Zion over them. You pray over them. You say they don't understand. Ah, but their spirits will receive and drink in the anointing. You will be amazed what can be changed in that children's ministry, in that infant ministry, just by bringing the presence of the Holy Spirit. So teaching children is more than just teaching them the right things. It's giving them revelation. Bringing them into the knowledge of God. Showing them that salvation is not by trying, but it's by yielding, surrendering. I tell children, I say, listen, the simple gospel that I tell children is this. I said, Jesus came to give us a bag of gold for a bag of garbage. That's the best deal in town. Bag of gold for a bag of garbage. But you've got to be willing to get rid of your garbage. What's your garbage? You. Selfish, self-centered, mean, little you that wants to be number one, that doesn't want, you know, I, 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 me, me, me. We all have that problem. I love me. Who do you love? I love me and me, but I don't love me and you. You don't get that, do you? I said, I love me in me, but I don't love me in you. See, if there's one piece of pie left and I get it, I deserve it. If he gets it, it's not fair. I love me and me, but I don't love me and him. That's got to go. As John said with his little box, Jesus first, others second, and you last. Jesus put it, he said, the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. Everybody wants to be first. No one wants to be last. Kids want to come in first in a race. If they line up for something, they want to be first in line. Even religious people like to be first. You've got the first Baptist church, first assembly of God. No one wants to be last. Come on, folks. We've got to, we have to have a revolution of what salvation really is. It's not us, it's him. It's all of him. It's a replacement program. Get rid of your garbage to get the bag of gold. And eternal life is not an extension of, I tell kids, listen, it doesn't mean, honey, you're going to live forever. You know, you can't live. Your, it's not your life. It's your life being taken and his life replacing it. You go on the cross and he gets on the throne. You get off the throne of your heart and you get on the cross so he can get off the cross and get on the throne of your heart. He came from the throne to the cross that he might go from the cross to your throne that you might get off your throne and go on the cross. It is no longer I that lives, but Christ that lives in me. And Christ wants to live in every one of our children.
bring them into radical, anointed salvation. You can do it. You really can. It's available. Just preach the truth under the anointing. Get that apostolic, that prophetic, that evangelistic anointing. And if you have a gifted ministry coming in, say, we want you to preach to the kids. And if they can't preach to kids, don't have them. I wouldn't. Say, thank you. Try the church down the road. We want apostles to the whole body of Christ. We want prophets to the whole body of Christ. And the whole body of Christ in our eyes are all the children as well as the adults and all the youth. Amen? Hallelujah. Will you stand with me, please? Just before we pray, I do have Equipping the Younger Saints, which is um, a six-tape series of something that I've called, spoke about just now, and also... Uh